Solomon wrote over, uh, you probably know, right? 3,000 3, Proverbs, you know? Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, pretty strong. 3,000? He, he took lots of notes. Yeah, yeah, like you. Yeah. Well, Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 19 to 23. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it springs the issues of life. It's amazing when you think of uh, Solomon. Solomon didn't keep his heart. Of all people, that didn't keep his heart. And we know the heart refers to the mind. It's the source. It's the source of thinking and feeling and action. Those three things come. Solomon lost focus. He allowed his heart to be open to things that it shouldn't have been open to. And yet, like we were talking this morning, God was so pleased with him when he asked for wisdom. He could ask for all kinds of other things, but he asked for wisdom. But he didn't stay focused. The Father, I pray that we would stay focused, Lord. We look to your word. Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you that he guides and directs. We thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Lord. That lets us know when we should go to the right or to the left. And Father, we thank you for that. I want to pray for all those that uh, would have been here tonight but find themselves elsewhere. We pray that they would get home safely, Lord. I look forward to seeing them. Thank you for the service that we had this morning. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this little church, small church, but big in faith, because we believe in your Son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Does anyone play piano? No? Okay, Beth. You can do it. Uh, let's do the dog solid. Yes.
Tuesday night's been canceled, right? You weren't going to go anyways, were you? It says something about it was on somewhere, but I can't remember where, so we might be doing something. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Well, Dave, you're getting ready to take the offering? <laughs> you ready to write my check? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we'll do it. Yeah. All right. Well, you can do a repeat. Well, we, we'll do the same thing we did this morning. I can't remember what we did this morning. <laughs> well, you prayed. I prayed and you did that. And I walked around oh, the way. Yeah, you walked around the way too. <laughs> Again, Lord, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, for bringing us together. We thank you that we can worship you together. We thank you, Lord, that we belong to each other and to you in one family. Bless this evening, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to give to your work both here and around the world. Bless these funds in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Play the piano, do you? No? I, I, I play some piano. Yeah, I do. I just, I just play the E piano. Oh, that's all we can sing. Yeah. <laughs> you want to play an easy one? Probably. I, I can try. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Do I need it? Yeah. All right. No, that'd be okay. All right. Hey, that was good. All right. Yeah, that was good. See, you were you were meant to show up tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you so you just decided at the last minute I'm going to go to Brentford Bible Church. And then you called your two friends and invited them. Okay. All right, super. So so what church you guys normally go to then? Presbyterian. It's a PCA. All right. Have you memorized the Westminster Confession? Uh, no? But, but you're working on it. All right. Well, hey, we're glad you guys are here tonight. We're going to do things a little different. You never know what's going to happen at this church. Yeah. I was just going to, I wasn't sure what to speak on. My nephew was going to come. He's a student over at Northwestern, and he was going to come tonight, and uh, then I found out yesterday, he said, Uncle Brian, I want to be there. He says, I only have one week to uh, finish the book, and it's part of the scholarship he got at Northwestern. He's writing a book, and um, he's got to finish it. He says, I don't see how I could prepare and be ready, and I said, okay, don't worry about it. So that's, that's what happened. And then this morning, our Sunday school teacher, Bob Faulkner, uh, I found out yesterday that he wasn't going to be here. And so hopefully he'll be here. I'm hoping he'll be here on Thursday for Bible study. Yeah. He said he would call us if he couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah. But he's, I guess he's pretty sick. And then we had uh, uh, Asaph came, uh, came, and he did Sunday school. And uh, we were talking about how he was, his father it was born in India, and his mom is born in Peru, right? Uh, no, Brazil. Oh, Brazil. Okay, Brazil. And about, and his, his dad had a bookstore in India, and about 20, 20 years ago, uh, our very own Dave Eccles walked into that bookstore in India because he was a missionary over in India. But he was only, I thought he was a little bit older, but he, he said he was only, he was in a bookstore, but he was only one year old. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, he was here this morning. And then he was here a couple weeks ago. And uh, he was here with... Um, who was the other guy that uh, he was here with? Peter. What was that? Oh, yeah, Peter. Peter, yeah. Peter came to tell us about what's going on in the war, but now he's back for a while over in Ukraine and with Russia. I guess he was there for, how long was he there? Four, four or five weeks? Yeah. So he's back, and he's getting ready to go back again, I guess. But All right, well, I think we'll dive into... One parable. That's only one verse. That's in the it's in the book of Mark, chapter seven, verse fifteen. Now, Tom, you're familiar with that parable, right? If you have a study Bible, it won't tell you where the parable is. A lot of study Bibles will. But there's quite a bit to this parable. And uh 
he, um, the disciples still don't understand the parable. And it's amazing what, what took place. There was so much going on. Jesus' popularity just grew. I mean, by hundreds and hundreds of times over. And um, there were so many things that were happening just before chapter 7. And he, um, well, I'll go up to the pulpit and we'll open the Bible. Marlene, I feel like I got a bug hanging here. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. Now, Jesus' uh, popularity was growing, but hostility was growing, too. And uh, in, uh, he was in Capernaum, and now he, he crossed the Lake of Galilee. And Galilee, is, it's not a really a sea, it's a lake. And it's, it's not all that big. It's the biggest freshwater lake in Israel. It's about 13 miles long, about 8 miles across. I think it's 340 feet deep. And it's their main source of uh, fresh water over in Israel. And that's, that's the biggest lake over there. The biggest lake in America is Lake Michigan, right? But Lake Superior and the other Great Lakes, some of those are bigger than Lake Michigan, but we share ownership with Canada. But Lake Michigan, we don't share ownership with anybody. And Lake Michigan's pretty big. It's like 300 miles long. I think at the widest point, it's 75 miles across about 1,200 feet deep. And um, I used to sail a sailboat in Lake Michigan. A lot of times I'd go halfway across the lake and I'd be able to see Chicago and then I would head back to Michigan. But that's only if the wind was just right. If the wind would change, boy, it would take a long time to get back. You'd be stuck out there a long time on a little tiny sunfish sailboat that's 14 feet long and only had 75 square feet of sail. I'm out there all by myself, yeah. But uh, you get to a certain point, you, could, you can't even see the shore. And, um, and you have to keep going, and then all of a sudden you'll, you'll start to see the skyline. But this lake where the disciples crossed over, just before you get to chapter 7, the disciples were still recovering because there was a storm on the lake. And the Lake of Galilee is surrounded by mountains. It gets real windy there. And uh, I've been there several times, only by the way of YouTube. It's amazing how you go all the way around the world with YouTube. You just push that little remote control. I've been on the Lake of Galilee. I've been to Capernaum. I've been to the Dead Sea. Just by my new TV set, by going to YouTube. And, you know, that lake... For a little lake, you would say, well, how can the waves get that big? But it gets pretty windy and pretty rough. And the disciples were coming across, heading to Capernaum. And uh, they thought they saw a ghost. And it was Jesus walking across the lake. And they were astonished. And then he walks over and he gets into the boat. And when he gets into the boat, the water calms. That was the second time when he was walking across that lake. And so the disciples still haven't gotten over that. But before we dive into into chapter 7 here, well, if you just look at the last verse in in Mark chapter 6, in verse 56, it says, Wherever he entered into a village, cities, or country, they laid the sick, in the marketplaces, and they begged him. They begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. All they wanted to do was touch the hem of his garment. And when they did, they were healed instantly. That's amazing. Just touch Jesus. You're healed. And that's what they were doing. 
and they were bringing all kinds of people. Uh, earlier, uh, in Capernaum, they had people laying all over the places. They're bringing them on cots and couches just so that Jesus would touch them so that they would be healed. It says, and as many as he touched, as many as, as touched him were made well. All they had to do was touch him. Now, it's, you say, well, what about faith? Didn't they have to believe? Well, they believed they would be healed. They believed that if they touched Jesus, they'd be made well. And they were. And they weren't just made, I mean, they were made perfectly well. I remember going down to the Bismarck Hotel. A lot of these faith healers would come from Africa. And uh, the only reason why I had access to a lot of that with Channel 38 way back in the day, my uncle was the president of the Full Gospel Businessmen. I had seven uncles. Three of them were Pentecostals and four of them were Baptists. And you can't imagine the conversations they would have. Yeah, yeah, a lot of uh, theology going back and forth there. But my uncle was a pretty wealthy businessman, and he bought Marigold Arena right here on the north side of Chicago and turned it into Faith Tabernacle. And that was way back in the day. And Rick, you probably remember that, right? Because Rick came out of the Jesus People movement with Chuck Smith in California. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, my uncle was Henry Carlson, and he was a, a strong Pentecostal. He was involved in the Toronto Blessing and all that stuff. A lot of you probably don't even remember that. That goes way back. But he loved the Lord. He loved Jesus. And I was, I was caught in the middle of all that. You know, when I was younger, I thought I was saved just by saying a prayer. And I said the sinner's prayer over and over. But when I was 27, that's when I realized that, that I needed to be saved. And it was more than just confession. One must repent and come to faith in Christ Jesus. But that's a whole other matter. We've got to get to this parable. It's only one verse. And it's going to take half the night to get there. But, can you hear me okay? I keep getting a shadow here with this. Okay. But the parable is verse 15 in chapter 7. And Jesus said, There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him those are the things that defile a man. Now, that's, that's the parable. But we've got to back up. We've got to go all the way to chapter 1. See, Jesus always has a good reason for telling parables. And he tells them at the right time, and he tells them for a purpose. And we won't really know the purpose unless we dive through these verses. Now, I'll try not to, uh, I'll let Scripture pretty much speak for itself here. You know, sometimes when you go verse by verse, you'll read the chapter, and then you'll back up and do it again. But I'll, I'll read the verses, and we'll uh, elaborate a little bit as we go along here. But chapter 7, verse 1, which says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together, came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, that was pretty far from where they're at. It was probably close to 100 miles. But there's a reason why. Now, the scribes came, Pharisees came, rabbis came, priests came. A lot of them were coming from Jerusalem because they heard about all these miracles, hundreds of miracles, maybe thousands some say it could be in the tens of thousands of people that were getting healed. I don't know. I don't know. But you can only imagine when it says they're carrying them from all over, from all the towns that were all over, and they're bringing them to Jesus to get healed. And so the Pharisees and the scribes, and the, they represent the commonwealth of Israel, is on their way there, about 100 miles to get there. 
It says, now, when they saw some of his disciples eating bread, eating bread defiled, that is, with unwashed hands. Now, that's what they're worried about. Unwashed hands. And we don't know if their hands were dirty. I mean, today we had a lot of food next door. How many of us went and washed our hands before we ate? I mean, that's a good thing to do. But they are so critical over their traditions. And you'll see tradition after another after another. And that's what religion does. Religion is full of traditions. And that's what the Jews were doing here. Unwashed hands, and they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way. Now, they did have special ways how they washed their hands. They had special ways how they would fold the towel. I've worked for a lot of Orthodox Jews. I was friends with a lot of them. I've worked for several different rabbis over in Skokie, remodeling their kitchens. <clears throat> I put in Orthodox kitchens, you know, two microwaves, two stoves, two refrigerators. I remember when I got in so much trouble, I put my coffee in the wrong microwave. Oh, man, I heard all about it. But I was fortunate because I bought it from on Dempster, and that was a kosher Dunkin' Donuts, and they had their kosher sticker, even though it was owned by Muslims. That didn't seem to matter. And so that, that helped a lot. And I got out of, I still was reprimanded a little bit. But when I made the kibbutz in the backyard in September, I was able to do that, but I wasn't allowed to eat dinner in there. I had to stay on the outside of the, of the kibbutz. But I got along with them. We were friends, and I had a chance. We witnessed a lot. We talked a lot about Yeshua and Jesus. They didn't see the way I saw things when it came to Isaiah 53 and a lot of other passages, but, but they're, they're, they're blinded. They're blinded to the truth, and they still are. But they wash their hands in a special way, holding the traditions. There it is, the traditions again. You will see that time and time again. Now, traditions of who? The elders. Now, who are the elders? The elders take in all kinds of people in, in the hierarchy. I mean, you have, you have scribes, the priests, rabbis, and the elders have become corrupted. I think probably if you go way back, the last good elder was probably Ezra and Nehemiah. Those were some good elders. There's a lot we could say about that. But everyone from that time on, uh, they're corrupted. But we'll, we'll get to that, hopefully. But verse 4. When they, when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. They're all worried about washing. So they're always worried about the outside. That's why their religion has become a facade. So they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold. Like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels. Now in my translation it says couches. Does anyone have that? How do you wash? Well, I wash my couch. I've washed a couch before. <laughs> you ever wash your couch? <laughs> That's good. Some couches need to. I've sat on some couches and I said, you should wash this couch. But the couch here is, uh, I think it refers to bed. Most uh, will say couches of bed. So they wash their sheets often. That's a good thing to do. And they wash their vessels, the copper vessels, frying pans and stuff. Now, I've been married for almost 50 years. And you know how many times I've done the dishes? How many times have I done the dishes, Gail? Once. And then I was told about it. I was never allowed to wash the dishes again. <laughs> yeah, never. 
In 50 years, I haven't washed the dishes. My wife washes them every day. And I watch, I watch her wash the dishes. Right? Because my dishes that I washed weren't clean. And she likes clean dishes. Now that's good. We're all called to do different things, right? That wasn't part of my calling. For some reason, I think women wash dishes better than men, right? I don't want to get in trouble. I like women. I get along with women. I'm not saying they're just meant to do dishes. It's amazing how women could do two, three, four things at one time, and I got a hard enough time concentrating on one thing at a time. But anyways, so we get to verse 5, which says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according, there it is again, to the tradition of the elders? Now they should have said, why don't they walk according to the doctrine of God? They didn't. That would have been something to complain about. But they couldn't accuse the disciples of that. They were disciples. They were just learning the traditions of the elders. But eat bread with unwashed hands. It seems like that's all they're concerned about. They're concerned about their unwashed hands. And he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? Now in Isaiah 29 and other places is what he's quoting here. And Jesus quotes part of what Isaiah says. He says, This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and in vain... They worship me, teaching doctrine, doctrines, the commandments of men. The commandments of men. They should have been teaching the moral law of God, right? Even on this side of the cross, we're still bound by the moral law of God. We're saved by grace, but what's the moral law? The moral law, it's the Ten Commandments. Without the moral law of God, we wouldn't be able to survive in this world. I remember talking before, my, my neighbor, I thought he was thinking about stealing my lawnmower. He wanted to steal my lawnmower. I don't know that for sure, but he knew that would be wrong to do. And that's why he didn't do it. Now, he's an unbeliever, but he has moral restraint. He could make choices and decisions. He could choose not to steal my lawnmower because he knows it's wrong. And a believer, an unbeliever can do that. Now the unbeliever has the freedom. Before he was, when he was in his unsaved state, he was, he still had choices. But how how much free will did he actually have? We'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit that's coming up here. But as we go on to verse 8, it says, For laying aside the commandments of God. They lay aside the commandments of God. They lay aside the moral commandments. You hold, there it is again, the tradition of men the washing of pitchers and cups and making others other such things other such things you do so isn't that pretty typical with religion i mean it's all about the outside and that's what they're doing here he said to them all too well you reject the commandments of god that you may keep your traditions for Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. Now that's pretty amazing. He who curses mother or father. Now there's different ways you could curse your mother and father. You could curse them literally and audibly. Have you ever had anyone come up to you and start 
swearing at you and using vulgar language and saying you blankety blank this that and the other well it is this alludes to that but there's something worse that they can that can be done and that's coming up and Jesus talks about that he says but you but you say if a man says to his father or mother whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin. Now, Corbin was a type of offering that was put aside for God. And now they're bringing God into their conspiracy is what they're doing. Corbin, Corbin was to be put aside for God, but when it came to taking care of their parents, when they got older, and they didn't have a nursing home, and they had the funds to take care of them or to live with them, they didn't do it. They said because the money that they had is Corbin, so that they wouldn't have to spend it on them. And the Corbin, they never know. I mean, they would pay the temple tax, and they would pay their tithes and other offerings, but Corbin was a way out, and that's what they used. It says... That is a gift to God. And so they, they blamed God. And they brought God into their conspiracy. That this is a way to get out of taking care of our, our parents. And we know what the fifth commandment is. Honor your father and your mother. And this was the greatest disservice that they can do. Not taking care of their parents. He says that you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Well, there's all kinds of things they're guilty of. And they bring God into, the, into their conspiracy when God has nothing to do with it. And we're getting close to the parable now. Verse 14. He says, When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, and here's what he said, this is it. He says, Hear me, everyone, and understand, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him but the things which come out, of, come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, they didn't understand this parable. Uh, some of them did. You'll see in a moment that the disciples had a hard time understanding it too. Now, the, 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 the parables, it's amazing how there was a parable that saved King David's life. Otherwise, he would have died early. And um, we know that because of 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it took a broken and a contrite heart. And the Lord knew what it would take. And the Lord used Nathan. It was Nathan's parable that brought about David's confession. Now we could go to that. That's in 2 Samuel 12. But that's a, that's a long story. I'll just share a few verses there. And uh, a lot of you know the story. There are so many parables in the Old Testament. There's hundreds. Jesus told 38 parables. I'm sure he told a lot more than that, but that's what we have recorded. If you count them, you'll, you'll come somewhere between 37 and 39. And all of them he told for a reason. He says here, in 2 Samuel 16, you see, Nathan couldn't just approach King David 
and confront him with his sin right up front. David was a reactor. He might have, he might have, would have done something he would have been sorry for. But it took a parable. But just a few verses here. In uh, 2 Samuel 16, verse 6, So it was, when they, when they came, that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical structure, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as men see. For, men's, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at, at the heart. Now, I wanted to read that, but that is... Um, That is, uh, well, we'll come back to that. But the parable that he told him was about the ewe lamb, and he, he confronted him of that sin, and it took a parable to do it. But he was God's anointed, and he knew the day that... Uh, he would take his last breath, and God forgave him. But it took the brokenness, and it took a parable that, that was going to do that, and he wasn't, he wasn't the same since. That changed everything for him, because he experienced God's grace for the sins that he was forgiven of. But as we go on in verse 17, he says, When he had entered a house... When he had entered the house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all food. And he answered, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, from within, out of his heart, of a man proceeds evil thoughts. And then he goes through the list here. Many of the things David was guilty of. Adultery, fornication, murder, theft, covetedness, wickedness. He said, deceit, lewdness, and evil eyes, blaspheme, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now, the Lord looks on the heart. It's the heart. The mind and the soul is the essence of, of who we are. But man was sown in corruption from the beginning. It goes back to Adam. But when you look, First Peter chapter 1, 22, well, 22 to 25, and what it takes to purify the heart. He says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love for the brethren, he talks about love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, born again not of corruptible seed, See, the biological seed is corrupted from sin. But now, this is an uncorruptible seed. The Spirit of God, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. 
because all flesh is like grass, and all the glory of men as the flower of the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flowers fall away. But the word of God, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So the Lord the Lord wants to change our hearts. And it took his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He is the one that made full atonement for our sins. And not just for ours, the sins of the world. First John chapter two, verse two, he died for the sins of the world. But we know it's only appropriated to those by faith. But back to David, and I still wanted to get back to um, several things. But Psalm 51, that's known as the, as the prayer of repentance, Psalms 51. Just a few verses there. In Psalms 51, verse 7, David says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be white as snow. And then in verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then in verse 11, he says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He didn't want to lose the Holy Spirit. It's amazing that on this side of the cross, the Holy Spirit resides within the believer. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We can't lose the Holy Spirit. We could break fellowship. We could quench the Holy Spirit. But we can't lose him. But David was concerned about the Holy Spirit leaving him. He didn't want that to happen. If we jump over to verse 16, he says... For you do not, for you do not, for you do not despise sacrifices, or else I would give it. He says, "You do not delight in burnt offerings." Well, he knew what it was going to take. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And David was truly broken over his sin. You could tell by his, by his confession that led to repentance. And the same with us. But there are... Uh, the Lord wants to... He wants us to see that he is the only way, he is the truth and the life. He knows, just like we had communion Sunday this morning. You know, we know if we confess our sins, we know he's faithful, we know he's just to forgive us our sins. And not only that, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Because he even wants to restore fellowship even more than we do. And so that's a love that goes beyond understanding. That's a, that's a divine love that, that came together. The righteousness and love came together at Calvary's cross and made full atonement for our sins so that we could be saved. And it gets better and better. There are so many things that he has in store for us. So there are so many other things to talk about here. And... Um, Normally I'll have uh, several good notes on the parables. This one I was trying to ad-lib and go verse by verse. But as we come to God's Word, it can be overwhelming sometimes. And you say, Lord, what am I going to speak on? We know you want a broken and contrite heart because that's the only kind of heart you could work with. But he's the one that draws. He's the one that enables us 
to believe. And what do we do? All we do is believe. We believe and we repent. So, Father, as we close, <clears throat> we just want to thank you for your word, Lord. <clears throat> There's so much here to expound on. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you that he was obedient according to your will. And, Father, we know there is no other way for him to go back to heaven except by way of Calvary to die for the sins of the world. We thank you, Lord, that he was lifted up on our account. And we believe, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, we could. Uh... How about close to me? One flat. Oh, uh, what about if I was short? Oh, okay, thanks.